the 29th of September 1990, on the streets of Belfast, the largest ever gathering of orange men. It was the climax to the tercentenary of the Battle of the Boyne. Tens of thousands of orange men were on parade. They came from all over the world, a unique gathering for a very special occasion. At the head of the parade, King William III, Prince of Orange. Behind him, 600 Williamite soldiers. 300 years on, the army that won the Battle of the Boyne was on the march again. As the parade weaved its way through Belfast, thousands of people lined the route. It was one of the biggest crowds ever seen in Northern Ireland, a spectacular end to an historic year for the community. At the heart of the celebrations was a battle fought 300 years ago in what is now the Republic of Ireland. As the armies of King William and King James faced each other across the Boyne, they could not have realised just how important the outcome would be. The war fought in Ireland was a significant part of the Glorious Revolution, which began in 1688. James II, King of England, fled to France and was declared to have abdicated. England and Scotland abandoned James because he was a Roman Catholic king, pursuing Roman Catholic policies. Ireland remained loyal to him, mainly for the very same reason. William and Mary were proclaimed king and queen. William was the Dutch son-in-law and nephew of James. Mary was the Protestant daughter of James. The Ireland of that time was firmly under the control of James' supporters, the Jacobites. Only Derry and Inniskillen defied James. William's main purpose in becoming king of England was to bring England into the alliance against Louis XIV of France. Louis hoped to keep William occupied in Ireland and urged James to go there and fight for his throne. Louis's support for James ensured that there would be war in Ireland and it would be part of the war in Europe. For me, and I think as I read history, it meant first and foremost the establishment of William as the king of the British Isles. In other words, in a year when he had already suffered a defeat in a naval engagement and in a Scottish engagement, if he had suffered defeat at the Boyne, then I would hesitate to say what might have happened in historical terms. I think it would have been a catastrophe for democracy and for the Protestant cause. On the other side of the coin, of course, it meant the defeat of Louis uh, the 14th, Louis XIV, the Sun King, because he was the one really behind James, not only in James's attempt to recapture the throne of England, but to impose his own form of despotism upon the islands. Throughout 1990, the Orange calendar was crammed with events held to commemorate the tercentenary. One of the first was the annual Junior Orange Parade on Easter Tuesday. And because of the year's special significance, the four junior counties of Armagh, Belfast, Down and Tyrone marched together. It was the first time they had done so since 1975, when the Junior Association celebrated its 50th anniversary. The Junior Grand Lodge was joined by representatives from Scotland and England. Junior lodges have been operating in Ireland since the 1880s and through the decades they have provided a solid recruiting ground for the senior ranks. In its early days the junior order was concentrated in the Belfast area but over recent years it has flourished throughout Northern Ireland.
At most orange events during the year, it was easy to see a renewed focus on history. A young William and Mary walked proudly among the ranks, setting the scene for the rest of the year. People have had to look into the roots, discovered some skeletons and discovering some facts that they weren't aware of before. And all through the land, from both traditions, there are people who are re-examining it. And it's welcoming for me to discover that there are Roman Catholic scholars and nationalist scholars who recognize the profound significance of the Battle of the Boyne. And on the other hand, on the Protestant side, where there were some who had been brainwashed to think it had no significance, they now realize it was full of significance. Carrick Fergus was the starting point for King William's military campaign in Ireland. The castle that dominates the town had been held by the Jacobite army. But the Duke of Schomburg, King William's general, laid siege to it for seven days in 1689 and forced out the Jacobites. The following year, on Saturday the 14th of June, soldiers of the Williamite army prepared to meet their king. By the front, left wheel, slow, march. King William landed at the pier in Carrick Fergus after sailing from Hoylake near Liverpool. It was his first time in Ireland. That key moment in history was brought to life as part of the tercentenary celebrations. Thousands of people watched the reenactment of the famous landing, the welcome from town dignitaries of the time, and the inspection of the soldiers. History records that William met a Quaker as he walked along the quay. By throwing his hat to the ground, the Quaker showed an uncommon respect for monarchy. William acknowledged him as the best bred gentleman he had met. The Quaker was invited to join William's party. And as local man Brian Blair continued his walkabout, it was back to the 20th century for a rousing welcome. With its castle and narrow streets, Carrick Fergus still retains some of its character from 1690. As King William made his way through the crowd, there was a merging of the 17th and 20th centuries. To commemorate the historic landing of William in Carrick Fergus, the local council held a special ceremony. centenary of the landing of William of Orange will only occur once and I trust that we 
appreciate the privilege that Providence has provided us with, that we can be part of that great occasion. The mayor was assisted by Captain Robert Dobbs, Her Majesty's Lieutenant for County Antrim. The King William of 1990 stood proudly in Carrickfergus Harbour, looking out to sea from where the King William of 300 years before had come. From Carrickfergus, King William made the short journey to Belfast, and again pageant brought history to life as thousands turned out to welcome him. Thank you very much, Mr. Lord Mayor. After being handed the keys of the city, there was a triumphant walk through the crowd. Everyone was shouting for King Billy and they wanted to shake hands, which is, you know, quite normal. So I went over and started shaking hands with the people. Uh, I, th I think the poor Lord Moore, he stood in the middle of Royal Avenue and nobody shouted, you know, Fred, would you like to come and shake hands with me? It was all sort of, you know, people wanted their children to go home and sort of say, you know, we shook hands with King Billy last night. There was, <laughs> there was more honour in shaking hands with a commoner acting King Billy than there was actually in shaking hands with the Lord Moore that evening. I think uh, by the time we got the Royal Avenue, our, my adrenaline was pumping through my veins so quick, you know. You're almost numb. The people just keep reaching out their hands and you just shake his hands with as many people as you can. You know, cross from one side of the road to the other, you know, so you don't ignore everyone on just one side. And, I mean, you just carry on, do your best. And the, the people really, I, th I think what happens is you get lost in the whole atmosphere. The, the people actually were so excited and so pleased to see this little bit of pageantry. There was also a solemn and spiritual side to the tercentenary year. St. Patrick's Cathedral in Armagh was the setting for a church service on a July evening. Services were held all over Northern Ireland as orange men were asked to remember the religious foundations of their institution.